Uh, the next talk is going to be presented by Sasha McGee, M9, and she's at GR Harrison Spectroscopy Laboratory. She's going to be talking about real-time spectroscopic assessment of epithelial dysplasia in the oral cavity. So good morning. Um, so, my name is Sasha McGee and I work at the GR Harrison Spectroscopy Laboratory at MIT uh, under the direction of Michael Feld. So first, um, just to tell you the motivation for the work that we're doing is that we want to use reflectance and fluorescence spectroscopy as a non-invasive tool for detecting oral cancer. So currently the gold standard for detecting cancer involves biopsy in which you cut and remove a piece of tissue and you put it through a lot of processing and you look at it under the microscope and our goal is to uh, hopefully use the information in light to be able to find out the same information whether a specific tissue site is um, normal or cancerous non-invasively. And so the work that I'll be describing today is focusing on our healthy volunteer study. We're also involved in a patient study where we're looking at lesions but um, today I'll be talking about our healthy volunteer study. And the motivation for this work is that the architecture of the oral cavity is complex and varied. There are different sites in the oral cavity, also known as the mouth. Uh, so you have your cheek, uh, you have different aspects of your tongue, you have your palate. And so these anatomic differences may contribute to spectral differences. So we want to apply the differences in the spectra to detect disease. However, these can also contribute to changes in the parameters, which I'll describe shortly. So therefore, we feel that a critical first step in developing a diagnostic algorithm using these two spectroscopic techniques is to first characterize the spectroscopic variability of the normal oral cavity. So our strategy is that we use uh, diffuse reflectance and fluorescent spectroscopy, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, we collect data in vivo in the clinic. Uh, here's showing our investigational clinical instrument, which we use uh, in real patients who are coming into the clinic uh, for suspicious lesions. Uh, however, in this case, I'll be describing healthy volunteers, actually. And we use uh, a model-based approach, which I'll describe shortly, to extract spectral parameters. Um, so as I mentioned, we're using reflectance and fluorescent spectroscopy. So here I'm showing a typical reflectance spectrum that we would collect and the data is shown in black and the fit is shown in red and the reflectance spectrum gives you information about the scatterers and absorbers present in the tissue. And So what we do is we model the spectrum as I show you here the fit in red and we extract several parameters uh, relating to the properties of the tissue. Uh, here you can see these dips here which are due to hemoglobin absorption and also the overall sort of slope of the spectrum is related to the scattering properties of the tissue. And so here I'm listing, we have several parameters related to scattering. Uh, I won't go into the details, but we call them A, B, and C. And we extract several parameters related to hemoglobin, including the concentration, the oxygen saturation, and effective vessel radius. And we also um, incorporate the absorber beta carotene in our, into our model. From our fluorescence spectrum, which is shown here as one example, we extract uh, information about various fluorophores present within the tissue. Um, for example, NADH, tryptophan, which is an amino acid, and structural proteins such as collagen. And so in the case when we study lesions, uh, we correlate these parameters with the pathology. So the, pa the patient that we study is getting a biopsy, and we correlate our parameters to the actual uh, pathological state of the tissue, and that's how we try to develop diagnostic algorithms. So as I mentioned, um, we wanted to do a healthy volunteer study because there's so many different sites within the mouth. And so we specifically studied nine different sites in the oral cavity. Uh, showing you a diagram here, we studied the different aspects of the tongue, including the dorsal, the ventral, and the lateral surface. Uh, we studied the cheek or the buccal mucosa, the floor of the mouth, which is the region here. Uh, we looked at the different areas of the palate, including the hard and the soft palate. 
and we also looked at the gingiva or the gums. And we collected in vivo spectra from 79 volunteers, um, and we collected a total of 710 spectra. So the first thing that we notice here, I'm showing an example as a plot of the C parameter, which is related to the scattering as a function of the nine different sites, and I've just abbreviated them here, is that there is a huge spread among the various sites for our parameter, and that the spread in the distribution for the various sites is different. And then we can look at it more closely and see that there's approximately three different groups which are apparent, and that the differences between each of these three groups is significant. Another thing we'd like to take advantage of is the fact that we extract parameters which are, um, we can directly relate to a physical property or biochemical property of the tissue. And so there are different features um, which are, can be present uh, in the various sites. And one of them is keratin. Keratin is a structural protein which sometimes coats the surfaces of um, places such as the gingiva and hard palate, which are normally exposed to a lot of friction from chewing and um, such. So this is a feature uh, which you can see under the microscope as well. And we found that sites which have this overlying keratin tend to exhibit certain trends in our parameters. And um, from those trends, we can get an indication of what is the effect of keratin, say, on our spectral parameters. Um, hemoglobin is another feature. We found that uh, the, the least amount of hemoglobin was found for the gingiva and hard palate, and these are sites which are not as extensively vascularized as other sites. Uh, the absorber beta carotene I mentioned, this is a fat soluble vitamin, and we found the, the highest concentration in the soft palate, which is characterized by uh, underlying fat. Uh, in terms of the vessels which we model, we found that the largest vessel radii were for the lateral tongue, at the floor of the mouth and the ventral tongue. And specifically for the floor of the mouth and the ventral tongue, these are areas in which the vessels are even apparent um, macroscopically. So what we do, we want to take a more, even more detailed look at the differences. So here I'm plotting the concentration of hemoglobin versus the A parameter, which is related to the scattering for two sites, the buccal mucosa, which is shown in black, and the hard palate, which is shown in white. And what we do is we use a logis logistic regression model, and we evaluate the performance of the separation using leave one out cross-validation. And we see here that we can obtain a sensitivity of 85.1% and specificity of 97.97%. So a perfect separation between these two sites would produce 100% sensitivity and 100% specificity. And you see that we're doing very well. Anything, you know, 85 and above or 80s and above is doing very well. And you can see it very well from the plot. And when we consider the architecture of these two sites, um, whereas the hard palate does have this keratin, which I mentioned earlier, um, the buccal mucosa does not. And if we consider the underlying uh, epithelial layer, the hard palate is characterized by bone, whereas the buccal mucosa does not have bone. And so we see that there's a clear differentiation in the tissue based on the different architecture of the sites. We consider another pair of sites I'm showing the buccal mucosa in black and the floor of the mouth in red. And you can see when we're plotting a ratio of the two fluorophores, NADH divided by tryptophan versus the A parameter, we can obtain once again a sensitivity and specificity which are fairly high. And when we consider the architecture of these two sites, um, both of these sites are non-keratinized. However, the epithelial thickness of the buccal mucosa is much greater than that of the floor of the mouth. And so another method we use to sort of understand the distinctions between the various sites is k-means clustering. So this is an unsupervised classification method. So we don't assume ahead of time that there are nine distinct sites in the oral cavity. And for each parameter, we identify which sites are similar and distinct. And so I'm showing the results for the A parameter and the ratio of NADH to collagen. And we found that for almost every parameter, there are sites showing unique properties. And by unique, we found that um, the buccal mucosa, or the cheek, tends to show an A parameter, which is significantly different from the eight other sites combined. And similarly, for the ratio of NADH to collagen, the lateral tongue and the hard palate 
uh, exhibit distinct values as compared to the other seven sites that we studied. And we tend to found in general that the keratinized sites, the gingiva and the hard palate, frequently cluster together. And so from our results, we've we have confirmed that the spectral parameters accurately reflect tissue physical properties. And furthermore, that spectroscopy is influenced by anatomic differences. And this is important because in our study of lesions, I'm showing a very common lesion in the oral cavity known as leukoplakia, and that just means white plaque. And here we have a picture of a white patch on the surface of the tongue and as well here. However, in this case, um, this tissue is absolutely benign. There's no evidence of any cancer. Whereas this one shows um, dysplasia, which is sort of an intermediate step towards the development of cancer. And so it's very important to understand how features such as keratin affect our parameters um, and be able to separate that from the disease process. And so uh, just the implications are this, is that the differences in the parameter distributions for various sites may make it difficult to diagnose disease when multiple sites are combined as you tend to get a larger spread because there's so much variation across the sites. Furthermore, spectrally similar sites may be able to be combined while preserving diagnostic power. We've shown that some sites are very similar to one another. And finally, a spectroscopic-based diagnostic algorithm will be developed in a site-specific manner to ensure accurate evaluation of disease. Um, and this is a collaborative project um, between MIT and Boston Medical Center and Boston University. Uh, and all of these people were critical in the success of this project. Uh, thank you very much. Right, so uh, right now we're not accounting for it. We could do something such as sort of an internal normalizations. Um, sometimes when people are studying lesions, they'll take a spectrum of the lesion site and also a site on the, maybe the opposite side where it's apparently normal and divide those two. So across patients, you're looking at sort of a, um, sort of like a normalized value. Um, however, for us, um, especially for the Healthy Volunteer Study, um, we've collected data across a number of patients. So of course we have distributions and it's related to a number of factors, including patient variability. Um, but um, right, right now we're not applying any normalization um, because sometimes when you're looking at patients with lesions, you are assuming that that site is normal, the one on the other side, but it's not necessarily because smoking, which is the main cause of oral cancer, exposes, is exposed to the whole mouth. Um, and so right now we're not using that approach. Right, so that's not done too often, actually. But, I mean, that's one of the ways that people would get referred for these, uh, these, these kind of lesions would be found. Um, however, uh, right now we more see it as um, sort of a guide to biopsy. So if someone comes in with a lesion and it might be large and you, you can't biopsy every little area um, or you're not sure which is the site which will show disease and indicate that you should need treatment. So this would be used to find the site most likely, or the most disease site, and have that biopsied. Um, so you can make the best choice about whether treatment is needed or not. Right, so it'll vary a lot. As I said, some are keratinized, some are not. There's different thicknesses. So we uh, feel that it's within about a millimeter. We're not pretty much going beyond that. Right, we could use um, the longer wavelengths and that'll penetrate more deeply. Uh, however, since the process of cancer begins sort of very shallowly in the epithelium, uh, it's kind of, that's the area where the most critical information would be. Thank you. Very much. So. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>